Okay, I think we'll begin. Um, good afternoon. We are uh, going to have a, a very interesting debate, I hope, this afternoon. Uh, the title of which is, What Will the Humanities and Social Sciences Do for Us? Um, so I hope we'll have lots of uh, uh, questions and, and interesting comments from the, from the panellists. I'm um, Dr. Anita Raghunath. I'm uh, a lecturer from the Free University in Amsterdam. And my, my, my co-chair for this afternoon's debate is Mary Alex Tree, who is from the University of East Anglia. So without further ado, I think we, we will begin. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the, de on, on the debate in a moment, but I think Mary Alex now is going to um, explain the rules of the game. <laughs> Um, so the debate is going to be structured around four themes. Um, hopefully we'll be able to go through all four of them, but there's a lot to get through, so we might have to squeeze some. So we'll start by discussing why we're having this conversation and why now. Um, then we'll move on to thinking about how we articulate the impact um, of our disciplines um, and the impact and their value, which will lead us to think about ways that we can improve our image, and then hopefully we'll conclude by thinking about cross-disciplinary collaborations. And, and ways of taking these ideas forward. Um, obviously, there's a lot to get through, so in order to keep to time, um, we might occasionally encourage our speakers to conclude or potentially cut them off, so sorry about that. Um, Anita and I will actually take turns asking the question, so if you see us moving around and swapping microphones, that's what it's about. We promise there's some method to this madness. Um, and then at the end of each theme, we'll also be opening up um, the floor to questions um, from the audience. Um, so please be ready to ask questions and engage. We really want to hear from you as well. Um, so you want to yep. say a little thing? Okay. Um, before we begin, I'm going to give you a bit of background, I think, for this human humanities debate uh, in order to just sort of settle down so we can get in, in a, kind of, uh, a kind of similar frame of mind, perhaps, for this. So increasingly, our societies subscribe to the idea that knowledge as reflected in the STEM disciplines, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, is the way of the future. Many from all walks of life assert the primacy of the STEM fields, while humanities and social sciences, it, the reverse is true, with ever more criticism about the real value of humanities and the slow dwindling of students who are less and less attracted to study at humanities and social sciences faculties in our universities. This is a worrying trend and one that needs to be addressed. With the increasing move towards results-driven funding and the remarkable scientific discoveries in STEM research fields, humanities and social sciences faculties are in danger of not only losing funding as grants are channeled towards STEM research, but perhaps of equal concern is the troubling but now all too familiar questioning of the value, measurable or intrinsic, of humanities and social sciences. Although it's not always substantiated by fact, there is a need to redefine our own worth, to take stock of how we communicate and demonstrate the value of what we do. The questions we need to ask, therefore, is what do humanities and social sciences have, have to play? What role do they have to play in a world that, we, that will be shaped by computers and genetic engineering? And more importantly, what is the relevance of humanities and social sciences within the university? This is perhaps more nuanced than it first appears. No one has said humanities do not matter. Rather, the question being asked is, as taxpayers, how much do we wish to spend on the study and not the production of culture? For a general public, the value of education and research in the STEM fields is by and large accepted, if not always understood. The empirical objectivity that the scientific method offers seems to provide a logical, rational expression of hard facts, focusing on new information and groundbreaking discoveries that take precedence in both public and political discourse. It can be argued that science gives us a sense of security and control in an uncertain world. But that is not enough. Let's consider for a moment where we would be without the ability to take these facts and visualize, reconfigure and reinterpret them using our imaginations to be able to acknowledge our susceptibility as human beings 
And to see scientific facts from a range of viewpoints must surely deepen our understanding of ourselves and open new possibilities for the application of science within contexts that allow for questioning and compassion. In fact, we can discuss the humanities and social sciences as being able to maintain the importance of subjective experience that complements and adds to the richness of objective scientific experience and knowledge. We know that arts and culture give us the very tools to take scientific progress to new levels of inventive and creative ways for the benefit of our world. But there seems to be a perception gap in the value of studying these in our society. Today's debate, therefore, will ask three underlying questions. What's the new role of social sciences and humanities in our universities? Is what we do still socially relevant? How do we develop a progressive agenda for humanities and social sciences? To an extent, the background of our debate is a perennial one. In fact, questions about the relationship and the hierarchical position between humanities and social sciences on the one hand and STEM disciplines on the other has rumbled away in academia for almost two centuries. As we ask these questions about the relevance of humanities today, we are to some degree continuing a dialogue that was begun by Thomas Huxley and Matthew Arnold in the 19th century and more infamously brought into focus by C.P. Snow and F.R. Leavis in the two cultures spat of the 1950s. These academics operated in times of seismic changes in respect of the division of knowledge into discrete and exclusive categories of culture and science but importantly spanned the period of the gradual erosion of the dominance of the arts and humanities as the more important fields of knowledge in favour of the natural sciences. The culture and science controversy is well-raked ground, but has arguably given rise to generations of scholars who have been naturalised into thinking in these binary terms, art and science, or perhaps more critically, art versus science. And these categories, categories are by now well embedded in our societies, even beyond the walls of our university. However, with a recent shift to more interdisciplinary ways of seeing, this may be a division that needs to be reviewed. The Aurora Network is committed to concepts of the social impact and relevance of research and education. And so we hope our debate will allow us to reflect on how humanities and social sciences are perceived in this context and also generate first explorations of potential opportunities within our network to collaborate in moving this discussion forward into concrete networks of support and exchange. We want to bring the topic up to date because this leads to fundamental questions about the future of education and research within our own institutions, but also crucially how we envisage the envision sorry, the value of connected knowledge pathways, not just in academia, but to be socially relevant for our developed and perhaps more importantly, the developing world. We seek to create a progressive agenda for the humanities and social sciences and hope today's debate will be a step forward in realising that ambition. Thank you. So we're now going to ask the panellists to introduce themselves in turn. So we'll start with Margaret. I'm uh, Margaret Hagen, and I'm the uh, deputy rector of the University of Bergen. Uh, I used to be, until uh, three months ago, I used to be the dean of the Faculty of Humanities in Bergen. So I have uh, some background in this issue. And I would also like to add that in, uh, um, in Norway, uh, last year we had something very rare um, from our government. We had a white paper on the humanities. So uh, that is uh, also maybe, um, yeah. So, so part of my experience has also to do with uh, us um, negotiating with uh, the white paper and the government for the future of the humanities in Norway. 
Uh, my name is Sarah Barrow. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of Arts and Humanities here at the University of East Anglia. Um, I've been here just three months. Um, one of the attractions for coming to UEA was the importance that it gives and the highlight it gives to the Arts and Humanities. And obviously that's now one thing I have to work hard to uh, secure and to, to keep going. Um, uh, before coming here, I was Deputy Head of the College of Arts at Lincoln University, where that combination between arts, humanities and science was increasingly important. Um, and working in partnership with colleagues across the university and outside the city uh, uh, was a, a very fruitful thing. So I hope we can consider those elements as well today. So my name is Guðmundur Haldanason. Uh, I am the Dean of the School of Humanities at the University of Iceland. Uh, I am a historian, Professor of History at the University of Iceland. So, uh, and this is a kind of temporary position that I'm in now and I, I look at myself more of a professor of history than, than a dean of humanities here, so. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, uh, my name is uh, Peter Mascher. I am the Vice Provost for International Affairs at uh, McMaster University in uh, Canada. And uh, listening to my colleagues, the first three, I'm, I'm uh, doubly uh, the odd man out here. <laughs> uh, first of all, my, uh, my background is, uh, is engineering, so I'm, I'm in the hard <laughs> sciences. <laughs> Um, and, and also, uh, of course, McMaster is not, maybe not yet, but not a member of the Aurora <laughs> network. Nevertheless, I'm, I'm delighted uh, to, to be here and have been asked to participate because I represent a university uh, that over the past uh, few years has made uh, significant efforts in uh, revitalizing uh, arts and humanities, even though we are a predominantly health science engineering driven um, university. Um, so as one example, we, are, we, we host and have hosted for decades uh, Canada's most successful interdisciplinary program in arts and science, which is uh, an elite program that accepts something like 5% of all applicants uh, per year. So just one example. So. I look forward to the to the debate and uh, to the interesting questions. Uh, my name is Patrick Levy. I'm the incoming president of Grenoble Alpes University in France. Uh, my background is not from humanities and social sciences. I'm a physician. I'm professor of physiology. Um, I must say that my personal interest in this debate is the fact that we uh, decided in Grenoble to focus on two different aspects. One is cross-disciplinary program, both for education and research. And we might actually allude to that and the role of humanity and social sciences in this type of education and research. And the second one is actually to focus on humanity and social sciences as a field of knowledge per se. And I think that's extremely important that universities really say that uh, uh, we want to put efforts in that specific field. I'm Ian Diamond, I'm principal of the University of Aberdeen, I'm a statistician uh, and uh, before I was at Aberdeen uh, I was chief executive of the Economic and Social Research Council uh, in um, the UK and I have just chaired uh, a major review for the British Academy of um, the skills that are gained by the study of the humanities and social sciences and that's the first uh, flagship project of a five-year program that the British Academy together with the Royal Society is putting together. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the introductions. And I suddenly realised, actually, without, without, without engineering this, we have the humanities versus the, the stem cell. So Mary Alex we may well have to throw herself in front of it in case it turns a little bit nasty. So let's, let's hope it doesn't. Okay. Okay, let's uh, get to the first question. So the first theme of the debate today is really, why are we having this discussion? Why, why, are, we, why are we questioning the value of the, of the humanities in this way? So, so perhaps, um, Goodman, would you like to, Goodman, Goodman, sorry, would you like to uh, start us off with, uh, with maybe a, 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 a comment on that to get us, get us started? Yeah, I think it's, uh, that is a good question. And, and I was wondering because, uh, in many ways, I don't think the humanities or social sciences are really in very much of a crisis. We're always talking about the crisis of the humanities and crisis of social sciences, but I don't feel that way. I, I, I feel that it is a thriving 
these are thriving disciplines and they uh, have always been uh, extremely important in the universities and, and they will be in important universities in the future. We have problems in financing uh, our, both our research and our teaching, although we are very cheap. <laughs> uh, comparatively speaking, uh, if you look at the financing, at least of our university, University of Iceland, then we are in the lowest rank in, in finances, but, but we have most students. So, uh, so I think uh, the humanities and social sciences are doing well. Uh, I think probably we are having this discussion in a certain way in continuation of the discussion we had in Reykjavik where we were, we were discussing fake news and... and and the importance of the academic community to uh, really to, uh, to uh, assist people in, in uh, sorting out the difference between uh, fake news and, and in quotation mark real news. So I, I think our role uh, in the light of what has happened in Brexit in the United, United Kingdom and the last election, uh, presidential election in the United States, I, I think these underscore the importance of our, 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 okay. our, our role in, in universities. Thank you. We're going to come back to that, that topic in a little while. <laughs> Actually, I'm quite, I'm quite curious. Margaret, um, you're, you were just saying in your introduction that, that, um, that um, in Norway they've, they've basically been debating the value of humanities. Perhaps you would like to say something in, in response to Gudmunda there. Uh, yes, but I think we are debating the value of humanities all over Europe. Um, it's not a Norwegian phenomenon. Um, we had this white paper out, but it was not only about the value of the humanities, but it was about uh, also trying to, to understand what the humanities is all about, because we are so used to use this word humanities, but if you think about all the different, all the huge range of disciplines that are con that uh, that um, that humanities contain, we go we stretch from data linguistics, which is almost science, uh, until philosophy, and uh, some or somebody also would like to include performative arts into the humanities. Mm -hmm. So there is a huge difference between those different the, this, this disciplines when you it's come to methodology, theory, th uh, the. Uh, the tradition of, of also these disciplines. So, what I think that we are questioning the humanities. It's uh, it's also part of the nature of the humanities to question ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's something that we do regularly. Every decade or every uh, twenty years, at least, we have these fundamental discussions about what is the use of the humanities, and we are. Uh, that's something that we we do because we are uh, uh, scholars in the humanities. But I also think that we have to do now with a more structural economical uh, situation. It's changed. Uh, the universities has turned even more, more and more uh, international. And we depend also humanities more and more of uh, external funding in order to, to do international research, in order to connect, in order to, to compete internationally. So I think, uh, and, and when you see, uh, how do you get the inter external funding? If you look at Brussels Horizon, Horizon 2020, much of that funding is challenge-based, challenge-driven. And I don't think that w there has been, and we know it hasn't been very much place and room for the humanities and social uh, challenges, uh, social sciences in Horizon 2020. So that's also part of the debate, at least in Norway. Um, yes, okay. I can talk more, but I, maybe I yeah. can come back. P after. Peter, I think you were, you were indicating you might have a, a comment there from the other side <laughs> of the fence. I, I just would like to follow up a little bit on, your, on, on the remarks that you made at the very end and come back to yeah. something that you mentioned in your opening sure. comments. Yeah. I think uh, part of the problem uh, is that we are, we are living in, in times where everything is judged by by the concept of return on investment, right? Uh, money is invested into the university system and somebody out there, whether it's the taxpayers or whether it's governments, uh, will want to know what, what is the outcome? What do we get for, for this investment? And to some extent, of course, engineering and the, and the sciences or health sciences, medical, doc that's much easier, quanti 
much more easily quantifiable, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, because you, you create new companies, you have economic impact, so that's much more easily quantifiable. But uh, that aspect is, n is not as directly evident <laughs> when you look at graduates from, from humanities and, and social sciences. It exists, but it's not that easily quantifiable. Okay. Yeah. Just, just to make a point. Uh, I, I say part of what you say, but I disagree with it. Uh, and the reason, well, the reason is that return on investment is part of the story. But the real issue is the instrumentalization of study. So if you are an engineer, you are likely, if you study engineering, you are likely to become an engineer. In the UK, we seem regularly at the moment to need new ministers in Parliament. Uh, and yesterday's new minister had a degree in philosophy. Yeah. But she didn't become a philosopher. And that's the difference with the humanities and social sciences. So if I said to you that 44% of the global leaders around the world are social scientists, or that 58% of the leaders of the biggest and most expensive uh, companies in the UK are humanities or social sciences graduates, then that return on investment is enormous. But their degrees in history haven't led to them becoming historians. Their degrees in philosophy haven't led to them becoming philosophers. Okay. Um, we, we are going to, and that's an incredibly important point, actually, something that when we were researching uh, the, the background of this debate, this was something that came up time and time again. It's, 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 a, it's a perception thing, and we are going to... I think talk about the perception of, of, the, of the humanities and social sciences, what we, what, what we believe and what's actually real. Um, just one extension of that then, but I want to just come back to this idea of why, why we're having the debate now. Uh, just, are we as humanities, you think, less socially relevant now than we, than we have been in the past? Do we, is, is, there, is there something about our relevance in, in, a, in a world that, that, that is basically uh, in universities that are facing funding cuts and stuff like that? Uh, does somebody want to kind of jump in with that one? I want all want to come in with that one. So very, very brief, we keep it very brief. Just uh, some comments on that, please. Just briefly, I'm not a statistic statistician, but just one more stat uh, to follow up from Ian, um, whose project I contributed to a little bit. Um, over 80% of the graduate jobs these days do not require, certainly in the UK, a specific discipline, and that's really important. But I'm not sure our students really know that. I think it is a visibility problem. I think it is a, um, uh, an image problem that we have, and that's why this debate continues to be so important. We have to keep speaking up. We spend a lot of time as Margaret said, kind of questioning ourselves and perhaps not enough time speaking out and being advocates and champions and that's our role. That's all I want to say now. Okay. Can we take, take one more comment and then I think we'll, we'll open it up to the floor, please. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think we should, um, when, when, when we discuss the value of the humanities, we should also uh, maybe distinguish between the, um, the research and the, the, the education that we give. When, we, when it comes to the research, I think the humanities has never been as important as today, uh, frankly speaking. When we have, when you look at Europe, how it's involving the democracy issues, um, I'm not going to talk about Brexit, I promise not, I'm not <laughs> going to talk about Brexit, I'm Norwegian, <laughs> I am Norwegian. <laughs> so, uh, but um, uh, maybe one of the, the largest failure of Horizon 2020 is that it didn't include the humanities and social sciences sufficiently because uh, we need more research on the democracy, on identity, on European identity, on European differences in, in Europe and the regional differences of the history of Europe and, uh, and the religions of Europe and the conflicts. And mm. So I hope I really hope that uh, we will have more funding for that kind of research in the years to come. Thank you. Okay. I think w one of the reasons for that, I guess, is the fact that there is a, a general feeling that in the society that uh, expertise uh, is has to be discussed, and and to some extent that uh, you can maybe, although it is it is discussed, you maybe rely on uh, hard sciences or medicine or whatever. But anything else can may actually challenge, and even that can be challenged. There is no no doubt. So I think this is not uh, at all um, 
understood by the, by the leaders who actually have to decide on these funding issues. And, and, and I think you're right, in a sense, the, the, the content of the Horizon 2020 program, I mean, reflect that to some extent. And it is even worse now that when we see that, uh, for instance, the alternative facts or the uh, post-truth. And, and, and I think we as universities have really a, an important responsibility in struggling against that and seeing that, of course, humanity and social sciences are extremely important for the society, are based on methods that are recognized, and, and it is important to, to go in that direction. If we don't do that, I mean, we, we don't, I mean, it's, it, it's then absolutely expected that the politicians, for instance, will not go in that direction. So it's a, it is our responsibility to do that, I guess. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I'm, what we're going to do at the end of each theme is we're going to open the floor for one or two questions from you um, before we move on. So does anybody have a question that they'd like to uh, pick up um, uh, one of the ideas for the panel? I'll, oh, sorry, I've got one of these. Are these working? Sorry. Would you mind taking Perfect, thank you. Uh, my name is David from Aberdeen. Um, I am a scientist, uh, but I, I did my PhD half of my time in social sciences and half of my time in biological sciences. Um, I interact regularly with humanities and social, uh, on a daily basis with, with these guys. Um, I think the panel raised really good points. I, I want to put a point forward and perhaps more turn into a question about the initial statement. Uh, which I wonder whether that is the reason why humanities are losing the public debate and therefore the funding uh, fight, uh, which is in many cases we, when people are asked, so what are the humanities? Uh, the answer is, well, we're not the sciences, and this is what the sciences are doing really poorly, and, and therefore we should, you should give us money. Uh, would it be useful to turn the discourse in action in a more positive manner and saying, we are the humanities, this is what we do, instead of trying to wedge perhaps a divide between science and humanities, which often, as some members said, doesn't exist. Yeah, and, and that's why uh, I'm a little bit hesitant to be in this panel, in a sense, because I don't feel that, that uh, we are useless. I don't feel that we have to defend ourselves. Uh, I don't feel that, that uh, we are in crisis. I think we are doing quite well. Uh, but I totally agree also with Margaret that, that we need more and more funding and we need, our voice needs to be heard. I, I was one of the two coordinators of a, of a huge network, European network funded by FP6 in the old times uh, with, with 100, 180 historians around Europe and we were looking at how history is written in different ways in, in Europe, how, how uh, the same events are described in two adjacent countries in a totally different manner. So these kind of historical uh, constructions of, of your past, they're, they are immensely important in, in how we deal with each other. So we need not to change history in the sense that we need to have a common European history. I don't believe in that. But uh, we must understand each other. We must understand that our way of looking at our past, uh, looking at our culture, is our way to do it, and other people do it in different ways. So we kind of open up to, uh, to diversity in that sense. So, uh, so I think, basically, we have a, a tremendous role to play. But there is a... There is a uh, there has been a change, if, if I speak as a historian, uh, it has been said that in the early 20th century the historians were the semi-priests and semi-soldiers uh, of the nation state. We don't look at ourselves that way anymore. We are more critical towards, and that is sometimes not very popular with those who pay our money, who pay our funding uh, in, in, in public universities, because we are criticizing the politicians who are paying us, so, so it's often understandable that they are not extremely interested in, 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 uh, in funding us. So, but that is our role. I mean, we have to do it. If we don't, we are useless. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in, in the musical Avenue Q, which I'm, I'm not sure very many people are familiar with this musical, um, 
One of the main character asks, what do you do with a BA in English? I can't pay my bills yet, because I ain't got skills yet. So it's obviously a very facetious song, uh, but I thought that would be, it, it's with this in mind that I'm introducing the second um, theme of our debate, which is articulating the value and the impact of our disciplines. And I think it would be great, actually, if we could get Ian, actually, to kick us off um, by talking a little bit about the British Academy's flagship skills. Well, very, very, very quickly, thank you very much. I mean, just, you know, we never question, and I mean, it's quite a bit, we never question the fact that it's really good to have medical doctors. <laughs> We never question the fact that it's really good to have engineers, but we question whether there should be people who can speak multiple languages. We question whether there should be people who understand num numeracy or can really understand what qualitative methods of research look like. So when we look at the skills that people who study the humanities and social sciences have, there are both generic skills and specific skills. The generic skills I, I would characterize as communication and collaboration, but not communication, I can do a PowerPoint presentation, communication 4.0, a very high level of communication and debate and discussion. When we talk about collaboration, it's about teams and diplomacy, not just a team building a widget, but really a, a deep uh, diplomacy. Secondly, research and analytic skills. Too often people say, there is... Um, a broken leg, that's a fact. A student I was talking to said, I've learnt an enormous amount about how to deal with facts that aren't concrete. That might be a broken leg. What do I do? Uh, and that's a really... You'll know the answer to that, by the way. <laughs> uh, but, but that's so important that we're dealing with uncertainty. We should be proud of that. And actually, the methods that come, whether they are fully quantitative with stochastic elements or whether they are qualitative, are deeply important. But we don't, worry, we, we don't pretend that we have them. And thirdly, the non-cognitive things that you learn through the humanities and social sciences around attitudes and behavioral change, it's fantastic that my colleagues in nutrition know what a healthy diet is. But unless the humanities and social sciences graduates can work out how best to get everyone to eat 10 apples a day, then actually we're lost. So I think there are huge numbers of set skills that there are alongside the specific skills like languages um, that uh, people get that we need to be incredibly proud of. And finally, the fact that we need to think in a world which is interdisciplinary. So one of the big challenges at the moment, it seems to me, is the technology around healthcare. Healthy aging, you know, elderly parents being able to stay in their own home because everything's so incredibly technologically well. If we don't develop those with ethics, with ethnographers so that they'll work, and with design people from the creative arts, then we will get nowhere. We need to forget about disciplines at one level, but at another level, if you are not intellectually strong in particular disciplines, I would argue that multidisciplinarity multi becomes much weaker. Thank you. I, want, <laughs> I wonder if we could uh, bring in some of our STEM colleagues, actually, um, to kind of go back on that and, and think about what, do, what does STEM value in the humanities? What is, what is their perception of the skills of arts and humanities and social scientists? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, I, I mean, uh, the comments uh, that we that we just heard describe actually very well uh, what the main issues are uh, currently also in um, in developing um, engineers that are. That, that feel that they have a responsibility for, for society. So communication at the, at the highest level is clearly identified as one of the key elements that distinguishes uh, successful engineers and scientists from not so successful uh, engineers. There are very few companies nowadays that would hire people strictly on the basis of their, of their specific technical knowledge if they don't if they are not able to communicate in the larger environment, they will not be, they will not be successful. The other part that, of course, is, uh, is becoming of greater and greater importance is 
um, social acceptance of technological solutions. And you, uh, you know, one can develop uh, what, what might appear to be, from a scientific perspective, the perfect solution to a problem, uh, but that perfect solution under given circumstances might completely be unacceptable to the society where you want to apply it. And unless the people who came up with these solutions have an understanding of where their solutions are going to be applied and what the social environment is, what the political scenario is, what the economic background is, uh, they will be highly unsuccessful. And uh, so, so without any doubt, uh, this, under, this basic understanding of, of how technology and scientific development fits into the overall society is a key, um, is, is a key element. Um, so I'll leave it at that for now, but uh, there are many more things to talk about. <laughs> I think one, one way to illustrate the, the, the importance, the crucial importance, I would say, of uh, humanities and social sciences in, in challenging and uh, tackling important issue for the society is, uh, of course, I'm, I'm, st I'm, I'm starting from something I, I know a little more. Um, I just want to introduce you to uh, the concept of uh, what we call health trajectories. So you have accumulation of uh, chronic disease, your whole lifespan and uh, you could you could imagine that actually medicine is a science that is sufficient to address that and in fact that's absolutely wrong I mean if you imagine that you can in a medical way of intervention and so on address that sort of issues you're simply wrong the fact is that if you want to tackle that you have to have social scientists you have to have urban designers you have to have, of course, big data researchers, and of course, public health specialists and, and epidemiologists and doctors. But I think it's extremely important if you want really to make science in a modern way, I would say, to have all these knowledge. And again, and, and, that, and for us as, as president or rector of universities, that's extremely important. Of course, you cannot do cross-disciplinary program if you have enough excellence in disciplines. I mean, that's also extremely important too. So I think, and, and we have a lot of examples like that, really illustrating the fact that excellence in humanities and social sciences and appropriate uh, way to address uh, global challenges are extremely complementary. Thank you. Just that point on the global challenges, um, I think a really great example of where those things have come together recently, uh, uh, especially in the UK, uh, through the AHRC-led Global Challenge Research Fund, where we've seen some excellent, very strong researchers in the humanities, the arts, and the social sciences, and the sciences come together to do some tremendous projects with real impact on people's lives. So we have several here. One I can think of right now is working in volcano communities, looking at fictions of risk, uh, working with communities to explore the imaginary worlds around that, but not just in that way, but to shape <coughs> potential responses, real responses in the future, and also to shape policy. So we're taking a wide range of possibilities there, and it's humanities at the heart of that work, which is so strong and important. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the floor? Does anyone want to jump in on this at this point? I've got someone just there, okay. Yes. Henk van Heuvel, Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. I think we are living in crazy times. <laughs> Interesting times. We are living in the era of post-truth. Um, Fact-free politics has been normalized even. I think this creates a golden opportunity for scholars in the humanities and the social sciences to act. And that, that would imply um, to participate in the public debate. It is happening, but is it happening enough? I don't know. Mm. And if it's not happening enough, why not? Mm. It may be because of the, the, the stress factor and the, the work pressure as a lecturer in the humanities and the social sciences. And everything you do outside of teaching, writing your publications, 
writing research grants, it's not having any merit according to academic standards. So would it be an idea if an active participation in the public debate would also be rewarded in some kind of way in job appraisals? <laughs> Just an example. That's a, that's a terribly interesting point. So maybe you could get you know, some, some funding for being <laughs> part of the debate. But. Uh, I think it's an interesting point too, but I don't know if I would uh, answer to the last question, but I would like to, to comment upon the, the fact that it, we are not participating in the public debate, because I think that's absolutely wrong. Uh, I think, I think uh, yes, but the problem is that we are invisible. Uh, we are everywhere. Uh, we are like, uh, just like the sea that everybody's swimming in. When we are the language, we are history, we are the identity, of the community, etc., etc., and I think that the community uh, uh, or the nation or, or politicians somehow they don't perceive us as humanity scholars because we don't have that label uh, on our um, front. So, so, so that's uh, something maybe to, to think about. But I also strongly believe that we should not. Uh, as so, so, so this is kind of complicated, but because on one hand, we are invisible because we are everywhere. And on the other hand, we, I think in order to, to show uh, our value, we should show and not tell. Uh, I think we should just interact, go on doing good work and interact even more um, in cross-disciplinary research and also have our students to to, to uh, interact and to more with society, uh, absolutely. And we could help our students to uh, combine our theoretical co um, courses also with more practice. But that's a different issue. Mm -hmm. When it comes to communication and to, to, um, to value that in job position, and it's, uh, I think, to. Uh, to some degree, at least we do it, but it can never uh, research is what what counts in the bitter end. So, yeah, and it should be like that. I think so. Okay, um, thank you. Actually, you've, we're moving on actually to the next theme, which is actually our next theme is is um, improving our image. Actually, so so perhaps this might be a, a moment to actually move into that. Okay, so we've got a problem. We we do seem to have a, a, a problem in terms of how we communicate what we do, how are we going to improve that image? I mean, we're having a debate about it. STEM scientists seem to be quite successful on the whole in being clear, and uh, well, it's very, if it's not completely understood, it's, it's very, it's very um, clearly communicated what, what the value of what, so for example, medical science does. What can we do as humanities and social <coughs> sciences to actually change that? We need to change it. What are we going to do to change it? Well, um, still, I, I, I must admit that I am not so sure that this is this is right. I mean, if you, if you, uh, and I agree with you, Margaret, that uh, we are, uh, I think, fairly visible in in the media, and 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 but we have been discussing this. Uh, what you were saying, how you can, in a sense, encourage this kind of social. Um, social communication and, 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 and participation in our work. Uh, and and it, 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 it is a difficult issue, it is a difficult issue, but it, it is clear uh, that uh, the media, for example, they are interested in our, our, our knowledge because we live in a human society and we are humans and we do debate and discuss and that is our, our, our expertise. So, um, so, uh, so I think uh, the image is, is not that bad, but we, should ne we need more funds. I mean, that's, that's, that's clear. We also need, need more, more uh, kind of acknowledgement of, of what we can say. But we recently had, had a survey, of, uh, we, which we do every second year of our graduates. And it, it actually came out in, at the University of Iceland. Those graduates, uh, the, the, these are who graduated two years ago, who were the most pleased with their education 
uh, and, uh, and what they had done for them in society were our graduates in humanities. They were much higher uh, percentage of them uh, said were very positive towards their education. Actually, their salaries were a little bit lower than the rest, but, <laughs> but they are, they are in, they are, it is clear that their education was something that was valued in society. And I think we, we know nowadays that no one is educated into going into a job, although I probably will be uh, in the same position my whole life. That is rather rare these days. Most people are are shifting uh, careers uh, and humanities uh, education is, is a really a good preparation for that kind of life because the flexibility of, of, of your education but also the kind of humility uh, towards your salaries and, and the opportunities <laughs> which I could see from the survey that people were pleased all, although as you say their salaries were lower. So I, I think, uh, think um, at least our graduates seem to be fairly happy with their education, and they could use it in, in society. Okay. I'm not sure I, I, I completely agree with your, with your <laughs> idea that we're happy we're being paid less. <laughs> However, I think uh, Peter wants to come back with uh, so let's, let's, let's tackle this visibility. Peter, solve yeah, it for I, us. I, I think there is, uh, there is an, at least from a North American perspective, there is an urgent need uh, to revive the culture of a civilized debate uh, on American and in part Canadian campuses it has become very difficult to have a panel where panelists are known that they will disagree on topics there is a tendency which is uh, very discouraging and very frightening there is a, a tendency to exclude speakers from panels because in advance, it is known that they'll be controversial. Mm. I think this is very bad for society, mm. and I think this is an area where uh, social scientists, humanity, uh, the humanities, historians, uh, political scientists need to speak up and need to give, uh, in particular in a university environment, um, give strength to the to the argument that you can have a debate even though you might, uh, you might disagree. Uh, this is one of the real concerns that I have about what is happening currently. At le I don't know about Europe, but uh, yeah. uh, certainly, certainly in North America there is a, a frightening tendency to exclude people with undesired opinions. Yeah, that's an absolutely crucial point. So, so Ian, could, could maybe you could... Make three very oh, yeah, quick points, of course, really sorry, super yes, quick. Yes, please do. The first point <laughs> is to agree with a colleague there. It's incredibly important. And I think in the UK, uh, 10 years ago, almost no universities would have had public engagement or uh, commercialization as part of their promotions values. Now almost all do. And I think that's a very positive advance. Secondly, there is a fantastic article this morning in a UK newspaper which talks about the way in which we commercialise research and talks about lights coming on mm -hmm. uh, in a researcher's brain and then 10 years later they're very rich. I've never had a light come on <laughs> moment in my life. Um, and that's because in the humanities and social sciences it's largely about the accumulation of knowledge over a very, very big time so that in the UK when anthropologists were able to help hugely with the response to the Ebola epidemic, it was because of 35 years of yeah. working in Sierra Leone yeah. that enabled them to understand the culture that made that happen. And the third point I'd make, you put those two together, we have to be prepared to stand up and explain that this is from humanities and social sciences yeah. research over a period of time that we can come to some suggestions. We have to be able to say, this is what I do, not you could do this and you could do that. Okay, can I, can I just come back just very quickly? So I absolutely, couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. However, how we've got these amazing sort of uh, soft skills, this background of education and knowledge. We, s we still have a visibility gap. We still have a, 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 a difficulty in, in making that clear to a, to the man in the street, if you like, man and woman in the street who are paying the taxes. So can we think of a, a, one or two suggestions, one or two ways? I mean, STEM seem to do, do that very, very well. They're very clear in their communication. What could we do to improve? Well, I, I don't want really to talk about communication, but uh, I was wondering whether, uh, <laughs> whether 
new approaches would be uh, would make the difference and i'm just talking about the fact that uh, uh, to some extent the the amount of data is so important now that we we can actually develop what we can call data driven research in in social sciences for instance and that might make the difference a and the maybe the some sort of uh, paradox is the fact that we are overwhelmed by 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 data and actually uh, every one of us i mean uh, with uh, iphone all those things and what we have to explain actually is the fact that we can have a research on that from a social perspective and that can be done and should be done and can only be done actually in universities with with maybe new methods of extraction of these data to give some significance to what occurs, what happens in the society. And I think that's something maybe we have to explain and to illustrate for, for the society. Okay. Uh, perhaps we open up to the floor. Yeah, yeah, great. We've got one or two. Thanks, Case. Hi, uh, I'm a computer scientist. And I think the reason you're not relevant is because... <laughs> <laughs> Because you're aggressively, as a community, refusing to work on problems that are relevant to society. I'll give you some examples. I, I need to get this debate going a bit, right? <laughs> uh, ten years, no, 20 years ago, I was working on the internet. I mean, if you said to me that I was unleashing something that was going to enable the worldwide abuse of children in a very systematic way, I would have been horrified. Yeah, but that, that's what's happened. That was a consequence. You know, where were the humanities scholars when we were building that system? You, you just weren't there. You know, we, we built the system that we thought was cool, and look what's happened. Twitter, you know, look what happened with Twitter. There, this is time and time again, engineers and computer scientists are working on systems that are changing your life under your feet, and the humanities and social sciences are not properly involved. And I think you've got to get yourself involved in those projects. We're about to design an autonomous car which has already killed a person and many more will die before we work out what to do. So that's my, that's a more controversial and I hope more provocative uh, question than we had so far. I can't resist. Um, <laughs> I knew he was going to do something like that. Um, we were there, Richard. You weren't listening to us. <laughs> Seriously, it's, it's, it's a communication, it's a communication issue, isn't it? And I think... Going back to our... I'm going to quickly join them, which is, I'd love to say, at our last debate, um, a very entertaining uh, journalist <laughs> called uh, Greg Kelly played a parody of some work by Judith Butler. And I think that, that sort of business has to be addressed. You know, what has literary criticism ever done for society? You know, bugger all is the answer to that, really. Um, <laughs> That, that's, that's the issue, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm really interested to hear how do, you, how do you make humanities get off that rather self-obsessed work and move to work that <coughs> general society will really, really appreciate and should do so. Yeah, I think you'll always have the spectrum where people are dealing with those more abstract ideas which are less easy perhaps to communicate. However, the relevance, and I wrote down the word earlier on about consequences, I think that's our role, you're quite right, is to consider the consequences. And going back to our colleague at the front, we're at an absolute golden opportunity to collaborate and to work together and to stop more of these disasters happening, whether it's fake news, harassment, uh, new technologies that, that lead to these situations. We have to work together. Um, yeah, we need to listen to each other is most important. Thank you. No, I was just going to say something very similar. We need to co-produce knowledge at yeah. all times. Well, I think it's, it's very much about conversations. You know, one, f one thing that's going to have to be done um, post the UK leaving the European Union is to rethink aviation noise policy um, in the UK. Well, actually, European aviation noise policy I devised with some acousticians 30 years ago, and it was absolutely done from understanding the way people listened to noise, the impact on that, and the measurement of it. It had to be done by people.
people from different disciplines working together and having those conversations. I think we're starting to have those conversations. We've heard about the Global Challenges Research Fund. That, for the first time in the UK, is research which is required, required from day zero to be multidisciplinary. It's getting those conversations going and moving us outside of the silos of disciplines, which is so important. And that's why universities like this great one here have the kind of spaces for people to get together in a way they didn't when I was a junior academic. I think that that's actually moved us into the, the final theme really nicely, which is about cross-disciplinary collaboration. Um, so I guess I'd, I'd really like to hear from the panel and then perhaps also from, from the audience in a second about how do we make that cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary multi research happen? Anyone? <laughs> Anyone like to kick us off? I think uh, if I m might add to <laughs> continue that discussion about what has uh, literary uh, research ever done to society. Uh, I think um, one of the, what uh, just uh, just want to make this point because we are living in a w in an era now which are dominated by fiction. Fiction is all around us. It's not only about fake news, but it's it's the fiction industry. Uh, so, and I don't think that people realize that for dealing with this, this in in uh, in a even also constructive way, but an analytical way, we need literary scholars because that's what they do. They they know how to analyze rhetorics and fiction, and it's. Uh, so I think it's never been as important as today to, to, to uh, understand uh, uh, literature in a, in a wide sense of that word. Uh, um, when it comes to cross-disciplinary research, and I think that we should, the first thing that we should be really aware of is that we shouldn't be help disciplines. Uh, and, and that's always uh, kind of, um, it's, um, it's uh, perceived as a danger from the humanities that we have this, you, you have these research programs and then they have to add somebody from the humanities just like just to, to, to put a little bit more sugar on the cake somehow. Um, I think uh, so we just have to, to merge and to involve into the research pro uh, projects from the very beginning. And I think also that cross-disciplinary is something that we use far too often when we mean multidisciplinary. I think many of our research projects in the future should be multidisciplinary um, more than cross-disciplinary, because cross-disciplinarity is something that is really, really difficult to, to, uh, to do. So, so how do we make it happen? Anyone? <laughs> Just in defense of Judy Butler, then uh, I, I, I think her critique of our image of gender and understanding of gender has been borne out in our, our society today. I think we discussed gender in a very different way than we did when she, I mean, it's not only her research that had changed our vision, but she was actually on the front line of questioning uh, gender as a natural category. So I, I, I think she has done a lot for society. Uh, yeah, uh, Cross-disciplinary, I, I think basically, um, I agree with, I, I think you mentioned it, that we need strong disciplines in order to be uh, interdisciplinary. And we need to have, uh, have strong uh, disciplinary focus in order to work together. And I also agree with you, it is, it is imperative that we participate in projects like these, not as, as a sugar on the cake, because that's not interesting. I mean, it's, uh, a scientist doesn't participate in any reality in a, pr in a program and so we see or see doesn't find interesting. And we need to be, in order for these kind of collaborative work to, to function, then it needs to be driven also by, by the human, humanities and social scientists. So I think that could create all kinds of interesting ways of, of understanding gender, for example. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Just to relate to what you were 
really brief point. I think somebody mentioned maybe an Ian about spaces for collaboration. It's really important that universities design buildings that allow space for these collaborations to happen. They have to be structured in. People need to have spaces where they bump into each other, where they talk to each other, where things emerge. Um, is really important. I'm not interested in STEM, I'm interested in STEAM, um, in those things coming together. So we need to make those things happen at a stru structural building level as well. Have we just invented a new term? No. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I think that the, the, the answer to what we can do for, uh, to favor across this mini program is actually, uh, when, when you look at research, in most cases, we as uh, responsible for universities or research organisms, we, we don't really play a role in that. I mean, researchers are actually doing their own research and that's it. On the opposite, for cross-discipline program, I think the top-down incentive action is extremely important. That can be, for instance, creating building for cross-discipline program, but that can be also addressing global challenges and saying to the scientific community, we would like that you actually put the knowledge together to try to address these challenges. And that's, in some cases at least, extremely creative. And for instance, we have put that in, in our initiative of excellence in Grenoble, and that was extremely fruitful. Of course, we also made strategic analysis of this, but I think in that cases, in the contrary of usually research is really bottom up, but procrastinating program to some extent as to be really designed or at least stimulated on the top-down process. Two unbelievably quick points. The first one is just what has literary criticism ever done for us? And the answer, just on a purely instrumental basis, is you wouldn't say that if you were a citizen of Hayon Wai or a citizen of Ullapool to very small communities in the UK which exist largely because they hold an annual book and literary festival every year. And I say that because that's absolutely no different than selling anything. You know, literary criticism can be sold and lots of people like it. That's a good thing, so we move on. Second point is I have been hugely privileged in my life probably to meet, read more research proposals than most people. And in so doing, it is incredibly easy to spot the research proposal where someone says, this is multidisciplinary and they've managed to drag a historian uh, that they once met and add their name to the bottom of the proposal and compare that with a team that has spent the time in the sort of spaces that we've heard really debating and discussing what the problems are and putting together a beautiful multidisciplinary pro program. And that's what we need as universities to enable at all times. I think we have time for one, maybe two audience questions. So whoever's got their hand up first. Um, yeah, hi. Um, to slightly, I'm, I'm Harry, I'm from the University of East Anglia. Uh, in my mind, to slightly answer the computer scientist in our audience, um, I think cross-disciplinary cross research would have helped you. You're clearly in, in need of some critical skills to think through what your inventions are doing, and that comes from the social sciences and the humanities. We shouldn't have to, like, mop up your mess afterwards. We should be involved in the process. So I'm curious to the panel how you think we can convince, social, uh, convince scientists to take us seriously? Is that something that we need to do or is it something they need to address critical thinking skills? I think we have to take ourselves seriously and, and be really uh, believe in what we are doing and, 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 um, and that's why I'm, I was a little bit critical of, of the question that we are debating because if we are constantly talking about how our, our crisis and no one listen to us, then no one is going to listen to us. So we need to have, be self-assertive and, and I think that is the way in, to uh, convince others that we are important. Okay. Anyone else want to come back? Anyone? Um, just to start my comment is uh, what a glory in the last 50 years is to be a nerd or, or geek. It's privileged by science and technology. Um, I've got the um, 
the background of economics of technology. And I came to this country, to England, 26 years ago to study in a university that is, it was cross-disciplinary and interdisciplinary. It was extremely difficult to talk to guys with engineering background and myself being an economist. It's, it was a nightmare at the beginning. But I studying at SPRU and in Sussex University gave me a widened spectrum of what do I need to consider when I try to create my fantastic gadgets and geeks, things that people are creating right now with the, all these mil multimillionaire guys that because of they've got very fantastic good skills on something, they can dominate whatever we want to think, to see, or to hear. And probably as an exercise of what is, um, we need to carefully think about when any of the fantastic technological developments that mankind has invented or developed, we needed to think at the same time what are the implications in the short, middle term, and in the long term. That is an exercise that philosophers have not been done in the last hundred years. That is, has been dominated by technologists and the ones that have specific skills for that. And that is my, my take on this. Maybe also the, the fact that we have uh, in cross Smith program humanities and social science researchers is also a way to try to answer correctly to what we mentioned previously, uh, responding to the taxpayers, why we're doing that. I mean, most of the research, if you think to it, is not really in a defined context. And, and the fact that we have really, really cross Smith program actually put also this research in the context of the society and its needs. And that's extremely important, even to support the fact that we do this research and we know why, do, why we do it. So just to add to it, I think it's actually very important to extend this interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary idea all the way down to the undergraduate level. Uh, because you want to you want to build uh, a student body and a, a body of graduates who who have this inherent field that talking to a variety of people with a variety of backgrounds is actually a positive thing and helps them uh, solve problems. They become then the researchers for whom looking for partners in different disciplines is a natural thing to do because they have already experienced that the input from colleagues in different in different areas is valuable and interesting and they have interesting conversations and, and so on. So I think the creation of interdisciplinary undergraduate programs is actually an important first step towards creating interdisciplinary research programs. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're going to run out of time, so we're going to have to close it in a second. And we really hope that these conversations will be able to continue beyond this particular debate and you know, continue tonight and hopefully in the, in the future of Aurora as well. So I want to thank all our panelists and thank you for coming. But I wanted to say, first of all, that as, um, as a final year PhD candidate, um, for me, these questions, the question of the employability of humanities <laughs> graduates isn't a theoretical one. <laughs> It's very real to me, and it's the kind of question that keeps me up at night, um, and it doesn't just keep me up at night. <laughs> um, as a survey, I can, uh, in a survey that I conducted of 468 doctoral researchers in the arts and humanities and 68 recent PhD graduates, um, I found some very similar anxieties to my own. As they contemplated their post-PhD prospects, numerous respondents reported feeling lost, feeling left behind, and extremely anxious about their employment prospects. Many of them felt really ill-equipped to pursue non-academic careers following their humanities PhD, despite the fact that in the arts and humanities, less than half of our PhD graduates actually end up working as <coughs> academics. So what's clear to me is that this communication exercise that we've been kind of talking about today and, and thinking about ways to refine it and to improve it is not only relevant and necessary at the undergraduate level, but it's also relevant and necessary and pressing at the postgraduate level, at postdoc level, and perhaps even at kind of faculty level. Um, so I would hope that the kinds of collaborations that we're looking forward to building, in part through networks like Aurora, um, will consider ways of encouraging intersectoral mobility as well as interdisciplinary exchange. Um, and so I'd like to conclude with an analogy. Um, our disciplines are like countries. Um, they have their own language, they have their own way of doing things, 
Um, and we like to identify ourselves spatially within them or in relation to them. So if our research takes us in new and ex unexpected directions, we sometimes refer to ourselves as disciplinary migrants. And I, I think of myself as a, a disciplinary migrant. Um, our disciplines give us an identity and a sense of belonging, and they make us feel safe. But our disciplinary traditions can sometimes constrain us. So ultimately, what I think we all want to get out of today is a commitment from the Oral Network and from all of us to not just to build bridges across institutions, but indeed across our disciplinary countries to create those spaces that we've been talking about, those structures in which we can all come together. I think we have so much to learn from one another, and I think we're only just getting started. So all that remains now is to thank our panelists again for so generously giving us their time and their expertise and their insights.